Moses is saying, I'd rather hang out in this dry desert with nothing and have you here on this mountain than, than to go there and have all of that but not have you. See, Moses learned something very valuable. And this, you've heard me say this before. You can have everything minus Jesus and it all equals nothing. But if you have nothing and you have Jesus, then you have everything you need. Moses knows this. He, he realizes this. He's had a taste of it. He's had a taste of God's presence. He's had a taste of this manifest presence of God. And once you get a taste of it, there's nothing else that you want. I think every single person in this room can experience the manifest presence of God in their life if they're willing to pursue it. It's not something that every single person in this place may have experienced up to this point, but it's something that is available for you to experience as God's presence in a deeper and greater way in your life. It doesn't have to do with salvation. It doesn't have to do with whether or not you have the Holy Spirit or not. It's just a matter of the awareness that you have of Him. You're already headed to the promised land. The promises are yours, just like He said to these people here, but there's a presence that's available that is contingent upon on your pursuit of him. How do you know when you've experienced the manifest presence of God? I say it's kind of like this, you know when it happens. It's not a question when you experience the manifest presence of God. And it says in verse 16, how will anyone know that you're pleased with me and, and with your people unless you go with us? And here it is. What is it that distinguishes us from all people over the face of the earth? What is it that distinguishes Christians from all people on the face of the earth? It's his manifest presence in our midst. In, in the way that when it shows up, people love one another, they forgive one another, they walk a crucifixion life like Jesus did. Jesus said, people are going to know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. And he actually said that the way that you produce that fruit is by abiding in me. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you have his presence with you, the world notices and it sets you apart from everybody else in the world. This is what I want. This is what I believe that you all want is God's presence with us. You know, evangelism becomes so much easier when you have God's presence in your life because people start saying, hey, what is it that that person has that I don't have? Why do they have such a peace in their life? Why do they have such a joy? even though they're going through that turmoil. In verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Literally, because you found favor. I found favor with you and I know you by name. In other words, you have my grace and because we have a personal relationship, I'm willing to promise when you pursue my presence, I will give you my presence and not just my presence for you, but it'll overflow to the people around you. Believer, that same promise is true for you and for me. Do you believe that? Because you have found his grace in Christ. He knows you by name. You have a personal relationship with him, and the more you press into it, the more you pursue him, the more he will manifest himself to you. So then Moses in verse 18, and I love this about old Mo, is that he's, he's like on a roll right now with God, right? So he's like going to ask him for something even more. So he goes, now show me your glory. The word now there means I beseech or please show me your glory. It's a begging. It's kind of like catching your dad on a good day if you're a kid, you know, when you're asking for stuff. Is there really a bad time to ask him for this, for these good things? You know, there's not. There's not a bad time. You know why? Because he's found favor with us. He's given us his grace. He is pleased with us because of the cross of Jesus. He is in an intimate relationship, a commitment to each and every one of us that he knows us all by name. And so we can go boldly into his presence and ask him for things, especially this, because let me tell you, as great as a relationship Moses had and the access that he had to God, you as a believer in Jesus have an even greater covenant and an even greater access than even Moses had. Maybe it's not as tangible as on a mountain, but let me tell you, you can experience the manifest presence of Christ in your life. Moses says, now show me your glory. And God says in verse 19, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. What does Moses mean by glory here? The biggest thing I want to zone in on is that the New Testament and the new covenant which we are in says that we see the glory of God when we see Christ, when we behold Jesus, when we get to know him. Hebrews says that he is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus is. John chapter 1, we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace in truth. You want to know God's glory? Then get to know Jesus. Behold Jesus. Learn about him through the word. Spend time with Jesus. God actually says a couple things when it comes to glory about what that glory is. And the first thing is he says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And then he says, I will proclaim my name. Name has to do with his characteristics, which he will expound on in chapter 34 when he actually does the thing that he's talking about doing. I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom 
whom I'll have compassion. Those four things. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. He's asking, I want to see your glory. And what does Moses mean by this? I want to see you. I want to see you face to face. I want to know everything about you. I don't want anything to be holding back from this relationship that we have because the glimpses that I've seen aren't enough. I want more. I want to see your glory. The word glory is the word kabod in the Hebrew. And, and it actually means weightiness or heaviness. It's kind of a twofold meaning. It, it, it's, it's the idea of something that's substance, the weight uh, of something, but it's also it also has to do with so much more. When Moses is asking God to show him more of his glory, he is asking God for an abundant overflow of himself in Moses' life that is weighty and heavy and tangible. He's saying, I want, I want to see what makes you who you are, what makes you so amazing. Show me your substance and your significance. God actually answers. He kind of says yes and no in verse 20. He says, you can't see my face for no one may see me and live. In other words, yes, I'll show you, but it's going to be limited because if I really showed you the fullness of who I was, it would kill you. Now just think about that. The four things that he says about his glory here, goodness, his name, his mercy, his compassion. If you, if you got to see those things in the fullness of who God is, it would kill you. That's how good it is. That's how gracious he is. I wouldn't even be able to handle it, right? We see all throughout the scripture when people would see God face to face and Isaiah sees God. Did he see the father or did he actually see Jesus? Well, when we get into the book of John in chapter 12, it seems to indicate that pointing at Jesus, he said when he, when he saw Jesus' glory and spoke of. But every time they would see Jesus, or a glimpse of God in the in the Old Testament, or even in the New. John, in the book of Revelation, it's like they fall over as though dead. In, the, in that moment, they realize how sinful they really are, how holy he is, how loving he is. It just wipes them out to the point where God has to lift them back up to sustain them. God's still got a plan for Moses, and he's saying, if you really want to see me to my fullness, it's going to kill you. There's people that say, well, if God was real, he would just, if he would just show up right now, and then, and then I believe. You really don't want that to happen, because you'd be a heap of ashes if you just showed up right now. That's how holy God is, that every part of our senses wouldn't even be able to take it in. We would just have sensory overload. And God is saying, but if I gave you the full blast of who I am, it would kill you. You wouldn't be able to handle it. And so this is a prayer that I believe all of us can pray. Lord, show me your glory, your substance, your significance. I want to know you. And the way that we see his glory is, Lord, let me behold Christ. Let me learn more about Jesus and his goodness, what it is that he went through when he came into this world, when he died for me, when he hung on that cross, when he rose again, what he's doing for me now, Lord, I want to see your glory. And as you behold Christ, you will have a greater revelation of his goodness, of his name, his characteristics, of his mercy, and his compassion. And one day, here's the good news, one day we will be able to see him face to face. 1 Corinthians 13, it says, now we see dimly as through a dark glass, as like tinted windows, right? There's coming a day when we're going to see him face to face. In our new glorified bodies, that actually can handle it, that actually can sustain it. There's coming a day where God's going to answer this prayer with a full affirmative. Yes, you will see me face to face one day and it won't kill us and it's going to be so amazing but he says you may you must not see my face so how should we pray? I, I think we can pray in this, same, in this very same way. Lord, please show me your glory to the maximum capacity with which my mind and heart can contain without it killing me. Lord, show me your glory. Whatever takes me to the edge, God, to that point where it's like, it would kill me if I knew anymore. I want to go that far. That's Moses' heart. God is saying yes to Moses. Why? Because he has found favor with God and God knows him by name. He has an intimate relationship with Moses and the same is true for us when we press in to agree revelation of who God is through the face of Jesus Christ. In verse 21, then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And the rock is a lot of times symbolic of Christ in the scripture. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. It tells us that the rock that they hit, that water came out of, was a symbol of Christ. And it very well could be that this rock that he is standing on is a symbol of Christ. So he says, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then when my glory passes by, you're going to hide in the cleft of the rock and my hand of protection will cover you as I pass by. And then in verse 23, then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And uh, wouldn't it have been cool to kind of be there and see what it is that Moses saw? Let me just read this chunk from Exodus 34 because I want you to see this. It says in 
verse 5, the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers of the third and fourth generation. And Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshiped, oh Lord, if I found favor in your eyes, he said, let the Lord go with us, although it's a stiff neck people forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance and then the Lord renews the covenant after that but I just want you to see how good how good the goodness of God is the very first thing he proclaims is that he is the Lord compassionate gracious slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin just that alone is enough to just think about how amazing God is and what I love about this is this is God's back if you're if you're to see someone's back. It's usually the most unidentifiable part of a person. But listen, this is how good God's back is. If God's back is this good and his feet are this good, how amazing is it going to be when we see him face to face? And one day we will. When he says, show me your glory, God says, I'll I'll show you all my goodness. I'll show you my name. And then he says, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is the goodness of God that when it says all my goodness, this the idea this is God. That's all God is, is good. I will show you the fullness of my goodness because that's all God is, is good. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. Even in his judgment, his love is good. His mercy is good. When we see his goodness, we are seeing his glory. His name is good. When we see his name and we see the characteristics of God, we are seeing the backside of his glory. We're seeing the afterglow of his glory. We're getting glimpses of who he is. And he says, I'll have mercy. On whom I'll have mercy, I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is God's sovereignty over whether or not he's merciful or gracious or compassionate. Because the Bible tells us that God doesn't owe mercy to anybody. That's why it's called mercy, right? Because mercy is something that nobody earns or deserves, but it's something that's freely given. God is saying, I have the choice to be merciful to whom I choose to be merciful to. God has chosen to be merciful to you, believer in Jesus Christ. He has chosen to be compassionate to you. And it's something that he has chosen to do. That's what blows me away. I still don't understand to this day why God has been merci- why God has been so merciful to me. May we never lose the wonder of his great mercy and his great compassion. And the more that we understand his mercy, that he's merciful to us, not because he has to be, but because he wants to be. Because he's choosing to set his affections on us through Christ. That just makes me want to love him more. And that really is what makes everything matter. God's freedom to demonstrate mercy is not limited by anything but his own divine choice. The Lord's favor cannot be earned by status, social class, or works. And if anybody needed mercy, it was these people right here who just danced around a golden calf. And there will come times in the Bible where God doesn't extend his mercy to the very same acts. But in this case, because he set his affections on these people, he chooses to extend mercy. And again, I believe that he does that to anyone who is in Christ. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. The word cleft here, it's this crack or this crevice in a mountain where there's somewhat of a cave a space or opening made by or as if by splitting to split or sever something, especially along a a natural line or grain in a rock, to make a way through something forcefully as if by splitting it apart. And I love that definition, all three of those things of that definition, because it is what the significance of the gospel is. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. They believed that when they read this, that this was all foreshadowing Christ, that the cleft, the rock that's been cleft for me, that I hide myself in, where God puts his hand over my life so that I can be protected from his wrath, but then I can still see his goodness and his glory pass by. It's all because of Jesus and what he's done for me. As the rock, the cleft was made by forcefully splitting apart, Christ was cleft, split apart from the Father on the cross in order to make a way forcefully through sin. He made a hiding place for me, a way for me to be found in Christ and with the Father. That song intends to compare life in Christ to being hid in the shelter of a great rock in a land that is dry, empty, and famished, and it's a metaphor for a sinful world, that even though we're here in this sinful world, that God covers us. It's only when we're hidden by Christ behind his sheltering hand of salvation that we have refuge from the judgment we deserve and great mercy to see and know greater and greater glimpses of his goodness and character and ultimately his name. Because of the cross of Christ, because of Jesus who was cleft for me, we will all get to see him face to face one day. Amen.